Hello, everyone. Welcome to theCUBE's presentation of the AWS Startup Showcase, AI and Machine Learning. The top startups building generative AI on AWS. This is season three, episode one of the ongoing series covering the exciting startups from the AWS ecosystem to talk about AI and machine learning. We have three great guests, Bratan Sahas, VP, VP, Vice President of Machine Learning and AI Service at Amazon Web Services. Tom Mason, the CTO of Stability AI and Aiden Gomez, CEO and co-founder of Cohere two practitioners doing startups and AWS. Gentlemen, thank you for opening up this, uh, this session, this episode. Thanks for coming on. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So the topic is hype versus reality. So I think we're all on the, uh, the reality is great. Hype is great, but the reality is here. I want to get into it. Uh, Generative AI has got all the momentum. It's going mainstream. It's kind of come out of the, it's come <laughs> out of the behind the ropes. It's now mainstream. And we saw the, the success of ChatGPT opens up everyone's eyes, but there's so much more going on. Let's jump in and get your early perspectives on what should people be talking about right now? What are you guys working on? Uh, we'll start with AWS. What's the big focus right now for you guys as you come into this market that's highly active, highly hyped up, but people see value right out of the gate? You know, we have been working on generative AI for some time. In fact, uh, last year we released Code Whisperer, which is about using generative AI for software development. And a number of customers are using it and getting real value out of it. So generative AI is now something that's mainstream that can be used by enterprise users. And we have also been partnering with a number of other companies. So, you know, stability.ai, we've been partnering with them a lot. We want to be partnering with other companies as well. Uh, in seeing how we do three things. You know, first is providing the most efficient infrastructure for generative AI. And that is where, you know, things like Trainium, things like Inferentia, things like SageMaker come in. And then the next is the set of models. Um, and then the third is the kind of applications like Code Whisperer and so on. So, you know, it's early days yet, but we clearly there's a lot of uh, amazing capabilities that will come out and something that, you know, our customers are starting to pay a lot of attention to. Tom, talk about your company and what your focus is and why, why the Amazon Web Services relationship is important for you. So yeah, we're, we're, we're primarily committed to making incredible like, open source foundation models and um, obviously Stable Diffusion has been our, our kind of first big uh, model there, which we trained all on AWS. We've been working with them over the last uh, year and a half to develop obviously a big cluster and bring uh, bring all that compute to, to training these models at scale, which has been uh, a really successful partnership and we're excited to, to take it further this year uh, as we develop commercial strategy of the business and and build out um, you know the ability for enterprise customers to come and get all the value from these models that we think they can they can get. So we're really excited about the future. We got hugely exciting pipeline for this year with new modalities and video models and wonderful things and trying to solve images for once and for all and 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 uh, get the kind of uh, get the, the general value and value proposition correct for customers so it's a really exciting time and um, very honored to be part of it it's great to see some of your customers doing so well out there congratulations to your team appreciate that aiden let's get into what you guys do what does cohere do what are you excited about right now yeah, so Cohere builds large language models, which are the backbone of applications like ChatGPT uh, and GPT-3. Um, we're extremely focused on solving the issues with adoption for enterprise. So it's great that you can make a super flashy demo for consumers, but it takes a lot to actually get it into billion user products and large global enterprises. Uh, so about six months ago, we released our command models, uh, which are some of the best that exist for large language models. And in December, we released our multilingual text understanding models. Uh, and that's on over a hundred different languages. Um, and it's trained on you know, authentic data directly from native speakers. Um, and so we're super excited to continue pushing this into enterprise and solving those barriers for adoption, making this uh, transformation a reality. Just real quick, while I got you there on the on these new products coming out, where are we in the progress? People see some of the new stuff out there right now. There's so much more headroom. Can you just scope out in your mind what that looks like, like from a headroom standpoint? Okay, we see ChatGPT. Oh yeah, writes my papers for me, does some homework for me. I'm okay, you know, yawn. Maybe people say that. People <laughs> excited, uh, or people are blown away. I mean, it's helped the cube out. It helps me, you know, feed up a little bit from my write-ups. But it's not always perfect. 
Yeah, at the moment, it's like a writing assistant, right? And it's still super early in the technology's trajectory. I think it's fascinating and it's interesting, but its impact is still really limited. I think in the next year, like within the next eight months, we're going to see some major changes. You've already seen like the very first hints of that with stuff like Bing Chat, where you augment these dialogue models with an external knowledge base. Um, so now the models can be kept up to date to the millisecond, right? Because they can search the web and they can see events that happened a millisecond ago. But that's still that's still limited um, in the sense that when you ask the question, what can these models actually do? Well, they can just write text back at you. That's the extent of what they can do. And so the, the real project, the real effort that I think we're all working towards is actually taking action. So what happens when you give these models the ability to use tools, to use APIs? What can they do when they can actually affect change out in the real world beyond just streaming text back at the user? I, I think that's the really exciting piece. I mean, so I wanted to tee that up early in the segment because I want to get into the customer applications. We're seeing early adopters come in using the technology because they have a lot of data, they have a lot of large language model opportunities, and then there's a big fast follower wave coming behind it. I call that the people who are going to jump in the pool early and get into it. They might not be advanced. Can you guys share what customer applications are being used with large language and vision models today and how they're using it transform that on the early adopter side and how is that a tell sign of what's to come? You know, one of the things we have been seeing both with the text models that Aidan talked about as well as the vision models that uh, stability at AI does, Tom, is customers are really using it to change the way you interact with information. You know, one example of a customer that we have is someone who's kind of using uh, that to query customer conversations and ask questions like, you know, what was the customer issue? How did we solve it? And trying to get those kinds of insights that was previously much harder to do. And then of course, software is a big area, you know, generating software, um, making that, you know, just deploying it in production. Those have been really big areas uh, that we have seen customers start to do. You know, um, looking at documentation, like, Instead of you know searching for stuff and so on, you know you just have an interactive way in which you can just look at the documentation for a product. And you know all of this goes to where we need to take the technology. One of which is you know the models have to be there, but they have to work reliably in a production setting at scale with privacy, with security, and you know making sure all of this is happening. Uh, is going to be really key. And that is what you know we at AWS are looking to do, which is work with partners like Stability and others, um, and in the open source, and really take all of these and make them available at scale to customers where they work reliably. Tom Aiden, what, what's your thoughts on this? Where are customers landing on this first use cases or set of low hanging fruit use cases or applications? Yeah, so I think like the first, the first group of adopters that really found product market fit were the copywriting companies. And so uh, one great example of that is HyperWrite, another one is Jasper. And so for, for Cohere, that's the tip of the iceberg. Like there's a very long tail of usage from a bunch of different applications. HyperWrite is one of our customers. They help beat writer's block by drafting blog posts, emails and marketing copy. We also have a global audio streaming platform, which is using us to power a search engine that can come through podcast transcripts uh, in a bunch of different languages. Then a, a global apparel brand, um, which is using us to transform how they interact with their customers through a virtual assistant. Uh, two dozen global news outlets who are using us for news summarization. Um, so really like these large language models, they can be deployed all over the place into every single industry sector. Uh, language is everywhere. It's hard to think of any company on earth that doesn't use language. Uh, and so it's, it's well, we're doing very, it. We're doing close. it right now. We got the linguist exactly, coming exactly. in. We'll transcribe this puppy. All right, yeah. Tom, on your side, where do you see the? Uh, the yeah, we're hand? we're seeing we're seeing some amazing applications of it, and, and uh, you know, I guess that's partly been because of the the growth in the open source community, and some of some of these applications have have come from there that are, that are then triggering this secondary wave of innovation, uh, which is coming a lot from you know controllability and explainability of the model. We've got companies like you know Jasper, which Aiden mentioned, who are using Stable Diffusion for uh, image generation in in blog creation, content creation. 
Uh, we've got Lenser, you know, which exploded and is built on top of stable diffusion for fine tuning. So people can bring themselves and their pets and, you know, everything into the models. So we, we've now got fine tuned stable diffusion at scale, which is kind of democratized, uh, you know, that process, which is which is really fun to, to see. Lenza, you know, exploded, uh, you know, I think it was yeah. the largest growing app in the App Store at one point. And lots of other examples like Nut Cafe and Lexica and Playground. So, so seeing lots of lots of cool applications. So much, so much applications. We'll, we'll probably be a customer for all you guys. We want to definitely talk after. But the, the challenges are are are, um, are are there for people to adopt. They want to get into what you guys see as the challenges that turn into opportunities. How do you see the, the customers adopting generative AI applications? For example, we have massive amounts of transcripts timed up to all the videos. I don't even know what to do. Do I just do I do I code my API there? So everyone has this problem. Every vertical has these use cases. What are the challenges for people getting into this and adopting these applications? Is it figuring out what to do first or is it a technical setup? Do they stand up stuff? They just go to Amazon? What do you guys see as the challenges? I think, you know, the first thing is coming up with where you think you're going to reimagine your customer experience by using generative AI. And, you know, we talked about Adal and Tom talked about a number of these ones. And, you know, you pick up one or two of these to get that uh, robust. And then once you have them, you know, we have uh, models and we'll have more models on AWS, uh, these large language models that Adal was talking about. Then you go in and start uh, using these models and testing them out and seeing whether they fit in use case or not. In many situations, like you said, John, uh, customers want to say, you know, I know you've trained these models on a lot of publicly available data, but I want to be able to customize it for my use cases because, you know, there's some knowledge that I have created and I want to be able to use that. And then in many cases, uh, and I think Aidan mentioned this, you know, you need these models to be up to date, like you can't have it stayed. Uh, and in those cases, you augment it with a knowledge base. You know, you have to make sure that these models are not hallucinating. And so you need to be able to do the right kind of responsible AI yeah. checks. Um, so, you know, you start with a particular use case and there are a lot of them. Uh, then, you know, you can come to AWS and then look at one of the many models we have. And, you know, we are going to have more models for other modalities as well. And then, you know, play around with the models. You know, we have a playground uh, kind of thing where you can test these models on some data. And then you can probably, you will probably want to bring your own data, customize it to your own needs, do some of the testing to make sure that the model is giving the right output and then just deploy it. And, you know, we have a lot of tools yeah. to make this easy for our customers. How should people think about large language models? Because uh, do they think about it as something that they tap into with their IP or their data, or is it a large language model that they apply into their system? Is the interface that way? What is that? What's the dev? What's the inter? What's the interaction um, look like? In many situations, you can use these models out of the box, but. In typical, in most of the other situations, you will want to customize it with your own data or with your own expectations. So the typical use case would be, you know, these are models are exposed through APIs. So the typical use case would be, you know, you're using these APIs a little bit for testing and getting familiar. And then there will be an API that will allow you to train this model further on your data. So you use that or, you know, make sure you augment it with the knowledge base. So then you use those APIs to customize the model and then just deploy it in an application. And, you know, like Tom was mentioning a number of companies that are using these models. So once you have it, then, you know, you again use an endpoint API and use it in an application. All right, I love I love the example. I want to ask Tom and Aiden because like most, my experience with Amazon Web Services in 2007, I would stand up an EC2, put my code on there, play around. If it didn't work out, I'd shut it down. Is that a similar dynamic we're going to see with, a, with the machine learning where developers just kind of log, log in and stand up infrastructure and play around and, and then have a cloud-like experience? So I, I can go first. So we're, I mean, we're obviously uh, with AWS working really closely with the SageMaker team. Uh, they do a fantastic a platform there for ML training and inference. And uh, you know, going back to your your point earlier, the you know where the data is is hugely important for companies. Uh, you know, many companies you know bringing their bringing the models to their data in AWS on premise for them is is hugely important. 
having the models to be you know open sources makes them explainable and and transparent to the adopters of those models. So um, you know we're really excited to work with SageMaker team over the coming year to to bring companies to that platform and and make the most of our models. Aiden, what's your take on developers? Do they just need to have a team in place? If we wanted to interface with you guys. Is it can they start learning? What do they got to do to set up? Yeah, so I think for Cohere, our product makes it much, much easier to people for people to get started and start building. It solves a lot of the productionization problems. Um, but of course, with SageMaker, like like Tom was saying, um, I think that lowers the barrier even further because it solves problems like data privacy. Uh, so I want to underline what Broughton was saying earlier around um, when you're fine tuning or when you're using these models, you don't want your data being incorporated into someone else's model. You don't want it being used for training elsewhere. And so the ability to solve for enterprises, that data privacy and that security guarantee has been hugely important for Cohere. And that's very, very easy to do through SageMaker. Um, yeah. But yeah, the barriers for using this technology are coming down super quickly. And so for developers, it's just becoming completely intuitive. I love this, there's this quote from Andre Kaparthi, um, he was saying like, it really wasn't on my 2022 uh, list of things to happen that English would become, you know, the most popular programming language. Uh, and so the, the barrier is coming down yeah. super quickly uh, this, and it's exciting to see. It's going to be awesome for the companies here and then we'll do more. We're probably going to see explosion of startups already seeing that the maps, ecosystem maps, the landscape maps are happening. So this is, this is happening. It's, it's, I'm convinced. It's, it's, it's not yesterday's chatbot. It's not yesterday's AI ops. It's a whole nother ball game. So I have to ask you guys for the final question uh, to, before we kick off the, um, the company showcasing here. How do you guys gauge success of generative AI applications? Um, is there a lens to look through and saying, okay, how do I see success? And it could be just getting a win or is it a bigger picture? Uh, Bratton, we'll start with you. Um, how do you gauge success for generative AI? You know, ultimately it's about bringing business value to our customers and making sure that those customers are able to reimagine their experiences by using generative AI. Now the way to get there is of course to deploy those models, deploy these models in a safe, effective manner and ensuring that all of the robustness and the security guarantees and the privacy guarantees are all there. And we want to make this, you know, we want to make sure that this transitions from something that's great demos to actual at scale products, which means making them work reliably all of the time, not just some of the time. Tom, what's your gauge for success? I, I think this is, we're seeing a completely new form of ways to interact with data, to make data intelligent and uh, directly to bring in new revenue streams into business. So if businesses can use our models to, to leverage that and generate completely new revenue streams and ultimately bring, you know, bring incredible new value to their customers, then then that's fantastic. And we uh, hope we can power that, hope we can power that revolution. Aiden, what's your take? Yeah, re reiterating Bretton and Tom's point, I think that value in the enterprise and value in market is like a huge, you know, it's the, uh, the goal that we're striving towards. I, I also think that, um, you know, the, the value to consumers and actual users and the transformation of the surface area of technology to create experiences like chat GPT that are magical. And it's, you know, the first time in human history we've been able to talk to something compelling that's not a human. I think that in itself is just extraordinary. It's so exciting to see. It, it really brings up a whole nother category of markets, B2B, B2C, it's B2D business to developer, because I think this is kind of the big trend. The consumers have to win, the developers coding the apps. It's a whole nother sea change. Remind, everyone uses the Moneyball movie as example during the big data wave and you know, the oh, you know, value of data. There's a scene in Moneyball at the end where Billy Beans getting the offer from the Red Sox and the owner says, the Red Sox, if every team's not rebuilding their their, their teams are based upon your model, they'll be dinosaurs. I think that's the same with AI here. Every company will have to need to think about their business model and how they operate with AI. So it'll be a great run. Completely. It'll be a great run. Yeah. Aiden, Tom, thank you so much for sharing about your experiences at your companies and congratulations on your success. And it's just the beginning. 
And Bratton, thanks for coming on, representing AWS, and thank you, appreciate what you do, thank you. Thank you, John, thank you, Ethan. Thank you, John. Okay, thanks let's so kick much. off season thanks, three, episode one. I'm John Furrier, your host, thanks for watching.